Hey, squirrels. <clears throat> Sorry I didn't get red last night. It just got too late. Chapter 11. It was Tuppence's turn to talk to the fisherman on the end of the pier. She had hoped against hope that Mr. Grant might have had some comfort for her, but her hopes were soon dashed. He stated definitely no news of any kind had come from Tommy, Tuppence said, trying her best to make her voice assured and businesslike. There's no reason to suppose that anything has happened to him? None whatsoever, but let's suppose it has. What? I'm saying, supposing it has. What about you? Oh, I see. I carry on, of course. That's the stuff. There's time to weep after the battle. We're in the thick of the battle now, and time is short. One piece of information you brought us has been proved correct. You overheard a reference to the fourth. The fourth referred to is the fourth of next month. It's the date fixed for the big attack on this country. You're sure? Fairly sure. Their methodical people are enemies. All their plans neatly made and worked out. Wish we could say the same of ourselves. Planning isn't our strong point. Yes, the fourth is the day. All these raids aren't the real thing. They're mostly reconnaissance, testing out, testing our def defenses and our reflexes to air attack. On the fourth comes the real thing. But if you know that, we know the day is fixed. We know or think we know roughly where. But we may be wrong there. We're as ready as we can be, but it's the old story of the Siege of Troy. They knew, as we know, all about the forces without. It's the forces within we want to know about. The men in the wooden horse. For they are the men who can deliver up the keys of the fortress. A dozen men in high places in command in vital spots by issuing conflicting orders can throw the country into just that state of confusion necessary for the German plan to succeed. We've got to make, we've got to have inside information in time. Tuppence said despairingly, I feel so futile, so inexperienced. Oh, you needn't worry about that. We've got experienced people working, all the experience and talent we've got, but when there's treachery within, we can't tell who to trust. You and Beersford are the irregular forces. Nobody knows about you. That's why you've got a chance to succeed. That's why you have succeeded up to a certain point. Can't you put some of your people on to Mrs. Perenna? There must be some of them you can trust absolutely. Oh, we've done that. Working from information received that Mrs. Perenna is a member of the IRA with anti-British sympathies. That's true enough, by the way, but we can't get proof of anything further. Not of the vital facts we want, so stick to it, Mrs. Beersford. Go on and do your darndest. The fourth, said Tuppence. That's barely a week ahead. It's a week exactly. Tuppence clenched her hands. We must get something. I say we because I believe Tommy is on to something, and that's why he hasn't come back. He's following up a lead. If we could only get something, too, I wonder how... If I, she frowned, planning a new form of attack. Part two. You see, Albert, it's a possibility. I see what you mean, madam, of course, but I don't like the idea very much, I must say. I think it might work. Yes, madam, but it's exposing yourself to attack. That's what I don't like, and I'm sure the master wouldn't like it. We've tried all the usual ways, that is to say, we've done what we could, keeping under cover. It seems to me that now the only chance is to come out in the open. You are aware, madam, that thereby you may be sacrificing an, inv an advantage? You're frightfully BBC in your language this afternoon, Albert said Tuppence with some exasperation. 
Albert looked slightly taken aback and reverted to a more natural form of speech. I was listening to a very interesting talk on pond life last night, he explained. We've no time to think about pond life now, said Tuppence. Where's Captain Beersford? That's what I'd like to know. So should I, said Tuppence with a pang. Don't seem natural his disappearing without a word. He ought to have tipped you the wink by now, that's why. Yes, Albert, what I mean is, if he's come out in the open, perhaps you'd better not. He paused to arrange his ideas and then went on. I mean, they've blown the gaff on him, but they mayn't know about you, and so it's up to you to keep under cover still. I wish I could make up my mind, sighed Tuppence. Which way were you thinking of managing it, madam? Tuppence murmured thoughtfully. I thought I might lose a letter I'd written, make a lot of fuss about it, seem very upset. Then it would be found in the hall, and Beatrice would probably put it on the hall table. Then the right person would get a look at it. What would be in the letter? Oh, roughly that I'd been successful in discovering the identity of the person in question, and that I was to make a full report personally tomorrow. Then, to s then you see, Albert, N or M would have to come out in the open and have a shot at eliminating me. Yes, and maybe they'd manage it, too. Not if I was on my guard. They'd have, I think, to decoy me away somewhere, some lonely spot. That's where you'd come in, because they don't know about you. I'd follow them up and catch them red-handed, so to speak. Tuppence nodded. That's the idea. I must <clears throat> think it out carefully. I'll meet you tomorrow. Part Three. Tuppence was just emerging from the local lending library with what had been recommended to her as a nice book. Clasped under her arm when she was startled by a voice saying, Mrs. Beersford. She turned abruptly to see a tall, dark young man with an agreeable but slightly embarrassed smile. He said, um, I'm afraid you don't remember me? Tuppence was thoroughly used to the formula she could have predicted with accuracy the words that were coming next. I, uh, came to the flat with Deborah one day. Deborah's friends, so many of them and all, to Tuppence looking singularly, singularly alike. Some dark like this young man, some fair and occasional red-headed one, but all cast in the same mold. Pleasant, well-mannered, their hair, in Tuppence's view, just slightly too long. But when this was hinted, Deborah would say, Oh, mother, don't be so terribly 1916. I can't stand short hair. Annoying to have run across and been recognized by one of Deborah's young men just now. However, she could probably soon shake him off. I'm Anthony Marsden, explained the young man. Tuppence murmured mendaciously. Oh, of course, and shook hands. Tony Marsden went on. I'm awfully glad to have found you, Mrs. Beers Beersford. You see, I'm working at the same job as Deborah. And as a matter of fact, something rather awkward has happened. Yes, said Tuppence. What is it? Well, you see, Deborah's found out that you're not down in Cornwall, as she thought, and that makes it a bit awkward, doesn't it, for you? Oh, bother, said Tuppence, concerned. How'd she find out? Tony Marsden explained. He went on rather definitely. Deborah, of course, has no idea of what you're really doing. He paused discreetly and then went on. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's important, I imagine, that she shouldn't know. My job actually is rather the same line. I'm supposed to be just a beginner in the coding department. Really, my instructions are to express views that are mildly fascist. Admiration of the German system, insinuations that a working alliance with Hitler wouldn't be a bad thing, all that sort of thing, just to see what response I get. 
there's a good deal of rot going on, you see, and we want to find out who's at the bottom of it. Rot everywhere, thought Tuppence. But as soon as Deb told me about you, continued the young man, young man, I thought I'd better come straight down and warn you so that you can cook up a likely story. You see, I happen to know what you are doing and that it's of vital importance. It would be fatal if any hint of who you are got out. Um, I thought perhaps you could make it seem as though you'd joined Captain Beersford in Scotland or wherever he is. You might say that you'd been allowed to work with him there. I might do that, certainly, said Tuppence thoughtfully. Tony Marsden said anxiously, You don't think I'm butting in? No, no, I'm very grateful to you. Tony said rather in inconsequentially, I'm, well, you see, I'm rather fond of Deborah. Tuppence flashed him an amused quick glance. How far away it seemed that world of attentive young men and Deb with a rudeness to them that never seemed to put them off. This young man was, she thought, quite an attractive specimen. She put aside what she called to herself peacetime thoughts and concentrated on the present situation. After a moment or two, she said slowly, my husband isn't in Scotland, isn't he? No, he's down here with me. At least he was. Now he's disappeared. I say, that's bad, or, or isn't it? Was he on to something? Tuppence nodded. I think so. That's why I don't think that his disappearing like this is really a bad sign. I think sooner or later he'll communicate with me in his own way. She smiled a little. Tony said with some slight embarrassment, Of course you know the game well, I expect, but you ought to be careful. Tuppence nodded. I know what you mean. Beautiful heroines and books are always easily decoy decoyed away, but Tommy and I have our methods. We've got a slogan, she smiled. Penny plain and tuppence colored. What? The young man stared at her as though she'd gone mad. I ought to explain that my family nickname is Tuppence. Oh, I see. The young man's brow clear, cleared in genius. What? I hope so. I don't want to butt in, but couldn't I help in any way? Yes, said Tuppence thoughtfully. I think perhaps you might. And that's it. So I'll stop there, and then we'll be at 12. Well, that wasn't long at all. And I need to give this thing a charge and charge! Working on a hat that looks like a sleeve. <laughs> Out of some of Gina's lovely yarn. Gina! Knitting turnpike. Be sweet, don't be ugly. Bye-bye. <laughs>